Since its founding by Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, the Catholic Church has faced attacks. Numerous hostile governments, tyrannical regimes, and revolutionary movements have sought to destroy the Catholic Church from without. But the greater threat has always been from within. In every generation, the Church has contended with heretics over questions concerning the very essence of the religion. In history, there have been erroneous understandings of the revelation that God has made in Christ. A heresy, it's not simply a falsehood, it's actually a truth, but it's a truth that's been broken off from the whole, so it's a partial truth. In this series, we're going to look at the great heresies. We'll see how the ideological struggles of the past are anything but fossilized subjects, but rather living temptations with which the church must contend again and again. Heresies never really go away. Uh, the ideas that are attractive to people in the first and second century still seem to have a lot of attraction for people today. And Along the way, we'll see how the doctrines of the church developed and gained clarity in the church's struggle with heretics. And we'll have a deeper awareness about what's at stake today. We'll explore all this and more on the heresies. August 4th, 1903, Pope Pius X assumes the papacy. He takes leadership over a church under siege from rationalism, materialism, and progressivism. In response, on September 8th, 1907, Pius X issues a papal encyclical called Pacende Dominici Gregis, feeding our Lord's flock. In the document, he condemns the heresy of modernism, something he calls the synthesis of all heresies. Well, Pius X called modernism the synthesis of all heresies because it is essentially an attack on the objectivity of truth, on the reliability of man's understanding of truth. Modernism is so dangerous to the life of the church because it questions our ability to come to know truth at all. One of the core problems of modernism is that it's a radical reinterpretation of human nature, of what it means to be man. It's a reconception of man as no longer a part of something greater than himself. What is modernism, and why is it so dangerous? To answer this question, we first have to distinguish modernism as a heresy and modernity as a period or epoch of history. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the Western world underwent one of the most significant cultural shifts in history. Technological innovations, scientific breakthroughs, and seagoing explorations mark the end of the medieval world and the beginning of the modern. There's no problem with actually thinking about modernity as a period of time. The problem is with certain claims that arise in the period, and that is what we call modernism. And so we should distinguish between modernity as a, a convenient periodization of time and modernism, which should be seen as a set of errors which arise in certain philosophical traditions in that period. There are many good aspects to modernity and many problems in modernity, just as there are in any age. Modernism moves from simply appreciating the age in which we live to exalting our current age as superior to all the rest. Modernism, in a short version, says that all of the historical understandings of Catholic dogma, Catholic liturgies, and Catholic morality no longer apply to us in our age. And now we need to kind of grow up and decide for ourselves what Catholic faith means. 
In the modern world, new ideas and philosophies begin to emerge, which stand in stark contrast both to medieval and ancient outlooks. One of the central ideas was individualism, the notion that the most basic building block of society is the solitary individual. For the individualist, man is essentially cut off from the larger networks of meaning, his family, tribe, nation, or religion, within which he wants to belong. Man is most fundamentally an individual, a solitary unit, an island in an ocean of chaos. The roots of individualism can be seen in the revolutionary thought of the Protestant reformers. In the Protestant Reformation, you have this first really decisive attempt to reinterpret Christianity apart from the actual reality of the institutional church. Protestantism suggested that human subjectivity was fundamentally individualistic and human subjective individual experience could encounter God primarily through the Bible. The Bible was the standard and the sole standard by which Christian religion, human religious experience was determined. So I had human subjectivity as an individual, not a pope, not a bishop, myself, me, and the Bible. Along comes Martin Luther, and he rejects philosophy. He rejects reason altogether. And so Luther bifurcates the harmony of faith and reason and what does that leave him with? Only himself as an intrinsic standard for judging. So here I stand is the famous cry of Luther. Here I stand becomes each one of us is our own pope. Each one of us provides our own authority. This is really at the root of the error of uh, Protestantism is the sense that Private judgment is the thing by which I come to know and understand Christianity. The Protestant reformers untethered Christianity from tradition, from the teaching office of the magisterium, and from the Christian community of believers, placing the sole emphasis on the individual's private and subjective reading of scripture. But this posed a new question. If the individual and his relationship to the Bible is now the linchpin of the Christian religion, is there one objectively true interpretation of the Bible? or as many interpretations as there are individuals. In other words, how is the solitary individual or subject to arrive at an objective truth that can be shared with others? This question, the question of authority, unleashed an explosion of new ideas concerning the nature of truth and our ability to know it. This became known as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a change in the type of questions that defined the human person. Before the Enlightenment, the most important question was what is real, what is true? Truth and reality were the object of human knowledge and human thought. The Enlightenment flipped that around and made the object of human knowledge, human thought, human questioning, the human person, the human mind uh, itself. The central project of the Enlightenment is to reconceive reality according to the absolute principle of reason and not just reason, but autonomous reason, reason cut off from faith. The image of the Enlightenment, it's a reference to light, illumination, and in part, there was this sense that the Middle Ages represented the Dark Ages, an absence of light, precisely because thinkers were under the subject to the authority of the church and tradition. And so the Enlightenment is a kind of a call to release ourselves from those shackles of tradition and to begin all things anew. The Enlightenment philosophers carried forward the Protestant emphasis on subjectivity, but now severed the individual not only from tradition and the historic Christian community, but from the Bible as well. Up next, we'll see how two Enlightenment philosophers, Immanuel Kant and Georg Hegel, took these ideas even further and set the groundwork for what would become modernist theology. Stay tuned. The Protestant reformers dissolved the harmonious relationship between faith and reason, siding squarely on the side of faith. The Enlightenment thinkers, on the other hand, discarded faith as mere superstition, enthroning reason as man's highest faculty. But as the Enlightenment progressed, other thinkers began to question reason itself. What is reason? What happens when reason questions reason? 
the philosopher Immanuel Kant did just that, and perhaps more than any thinker, set the groundwork for modernist theology. Kant uh, was raised by pietists. Um, he himself is a, is a Protestant. Uh, and like Luther, he rejects the idea that we can come to know God by reason. We can only know God through experience. We know God by faith alone. And so Kant actually produces the philosophy that makes sense of Luther. And this, of course, is a deconstruction of the whole metaphysical realism of the medieval world. Traditionally, Thomistic metaphysics, beginning and borrowing from Aristotle's own philosophical work, argued that human beings could come to know the truth of things around them imperfectly, but nonetheless could come to know the natures of things and the natures of themselves. So according to this Thomistic view, human beings were able by reflecting on the order of creation as a whole and the natures of individual creatures to reason to come to know that God exists and that he exists as the source of all of the perfections that we see in the created world. Kant calls this order of knowing into question. According to Kant, the human mind collects random data and sensory information and then organizes it according to the lens of space and time. All of the organization and order that we see in the universe is not in the universe itself, but is only in our mind as our mind collects and organizes the data. So according to Kant, we cannot then argue from our mind's organization of external information to God. For Kant, all our knowledge of the world is merely a construct of our mind. In other words, the mind is not a passive blank slate, a tabula rasa, upon which the world impresses itself. But whether our mind has an inbuilt structure through which all reality is filtered. He calls our experience of things as filtered through the forms and categories of our understanding phenomena. But reality as unfiltered, reality in and of itself, which Kant calls noumena, remains utterly mysterious and beyond our grasp. In other words, we no longer have any access to objective truth. It's easy to see how Kant's emphasis on limiting knowledge to the subject's own experience led to a privatization of knowledge and also a privatization of religious truth. Religious truth is no longer a claim about the objective world, about whether God is the creator or God is not the creator. Religious truth became to be seen as a private expression of my own experience. For Kant, we can't have objective knowledge about God, but there is religious sentiment. There is religious feeling. There is religious experience, especially the experience of our dependence on God. But this means as a consequence that whenever we think we're talking about God for a liberal Protestant, we're never really talking about God. We're really talking about our experience of God and how we're shaping that experience up. The result of Kant's philosophy was a radical agnosticism where religion moves away from having to do with objective truth to now being solely focused on the inner life of man, how I feel, experience, and then express my subjectivity. If Kant can be said to be the father of subjectivism, Hegel can be said to be the father of historicism. Hegel sought to recover a sense of human beings belonging to something larger than himself. To do so, he turns to history as a manifestation of reason. History for Hegel is nothing less than the gradual development and coming into consciousness of God. It's interesting because we tend to associate evolutionism with Charles Darwin, with biology, but in fact, it's a trend in philosophy before it's a trend in biology. With Hegel, with 
notions of a kind of spiritual development over time in which we are actually becoming different kinds of creatures. That we are not only becoming different kinds of creatures biologically, but we're becoming different kinds of creatures spiritually. Hegel says that God is so radically imminent. God is so radically near us. He's infused into the historical process itself. For Hegel, history itself is the process by which a cosmic social understanding and consciousness grows. And therefore, with any progress in history, you're moving away from the old, which is also the bad, which is also the passé, to the new, the improved, and the better. For Hegel, reality itself is equated with change and the dynamics of change, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And so the effect of Hegelian philosophy is that all things are in a state of flux, in a state of development. For Hegel, Everything in the world is in constant motion. Every individual, life, all of nature and society. Through a dialectic process of conflict and resolution, history moves forward towards the ever-increasing realization of human freedom. Man, for Hegel, through the faculty of his reason, is nothing less than a manifestation of God's process of self-actualization in history. Hegel's ideas about history and about knowledge as in a radical state of flux and movement and change affected religion because the ideas then of religion are not perennially true, but are merely discrete, concrete, particularized expressions of a particular time period's belief system. And because history is in a state of flux, religion itself, as a participant in reality, must be in a state of flux as well. One idea that came about was what we call historicism. Historicism is the idea that not just simply teachings are in some way conditioned by their historical reality, but that the very truth of a claim is determined by its historical setting. Historicism is that idea within a philosophical framework that a truth at one time would be false at another time. Historicism shows forth a sort of relativism through the course of history. One of the implications of Hegel's historicism is that truth becomes where history has reached at this point in time. This notion of truth is essentially historical. And Hegel's idea is that truth evolves through history. And so what is true at a particular moment becomes simply a stepping stone for some further development. And that means that looking back, we see it as not in fact true, but as just a, a kind of a momentary way station for a further development. The Hegelian notion of history is destructive because it takes the passage of time and man's interactions over time as a disembodied force which directs things in a certain way over which man has no control. This gave rise to the Marxist notion, for instance, of the extinction of the middle class, that the proletarian progress is such that the fading away of the merchant class and the middle class, that's the way history's going. So what do the Marxists do? They say, well, we can't wait around for history. Let's affect it right now. We'll kill all those people, and then we'll have the triumph of the proletarian spirit, which led to the destruction uh, of so many lives. And in the spiritual realm or the realm of, of Catholic doctrine and teaching, there are many who claim, according to a modernist spirit, well, while we believe that in the past, we no longer do. And the reason we no longer do is because history has its own force and you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. So let's just make it happen quicker. And that's where Catholic teaching then becomes the plaything of who's ever in charge. For Hegel, since reality is always in process, Truth is merely provisional. The best we can do at any point in time is a temporary interpretation of reality subject to further review at a later point in history. Kant's subjectivism and Hegel's historicism transformed traditional philosophy. Up next, we'll see how alongside modernity's ideological threats came political dangers as well. 
Stay tuned. The Enlightenment marks a great shift in the history of Western civilization. The philosophies of subjectivism and historicism pose fundamental threats to traditional Catholic theology. And alongside these ideological threats come political ones as well. The most horrifying example of which is the French Revolution. The origins of the revolution lie with another philosopher, this time a Frenchman, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. According to Rousseau, all corruption in society is the result not of man's sinfulness, but of society. Rousseau rejects the Christian notion of original sin and instead proposes that it is society with its power dynamics that is the corrupting influence on the natural goodness of man. Rousseau's philosophy thus reduced man to his animal instincts and sentiments and saw that society was fundamentally corrupt because it fostered the inequality of man. We can see some of these insights from Rousseau as they were expressed in the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. The French Revolution claimed the banner of liberty, equality, and fraternity. In many ways, it was the expression of the Enlightenment's critique of tradition, of authority, both of the authority of the church and the authority of the political regime. But one of the things that unfortunately it led to was first what became known as the reign of terror. That once it became legitimate to kill the members of the church and the members of the aristocracy and the members of the ruling regime, that it then became legitimate to kill any opponents of the current regime. During the revolution, the symbols of Christianity were replaced with symbols of reason. On November 10th, 1793, the Cathedral of Notre Dame was turned into a temple of reason, where the images of the saints were replaced with busts of philosophers. During the reign of terror, the Catholic monarchy was abolished, the church suppressed, church property stolen, and thousands of priests, nuns, and religious killed. All of this was justified by the revolutionaries because they saw themselves as agents of freedom. Once the decadent institutions were destroyed, mankind would finally be free to create the world anew under the banner of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The French Revolution was ruthless in demonstrating its religious superiority to the church. Its religion of man, uh, was seen to be the true religion, and Catholicism was seen to be a dangerous error that had to be suppressed. And so they ruthlessly suppressed the monasteries, the religious houses. They established laws uh, which sought to either banish or force Catholics to conform to the new regime. And in this sense, they were ruthlessly totalitarian in uh, suppressing the Catholic Church in France. In the aftermath of the French Revolution, there were fewer priests. Many priests were killed. There were fewer bishops. Many bishops were killed. Churches were shut down. Formal, organized religion of the Christian sort was not tolerated. And this indicates the aversion that the French Enlightenment, as expressed in the French Revolution, against hierarchical understandings and structures and institutions. The French Revolution uh, definitely came from the spirit of the Enlightenment in that it was an attempt to remake all things, not in Christ, but according to the dictates of whoever was in power. The ideas of the French Revolution, fraternity, equality, uh, these things have a Christian sense, which can very much be understood, but in the French Revolutionary scheme, they were used as ways to create a new public ethic or way of acting that would exclude God and religion and make man, you know, the measure of all things. In the 19th century, the church found itself under attack from every side. The Protestant reformers dissolved the harmonious relationship between faith and reason, making the Bible the sole access point to truth. The Enlightenment philosophers discarded faith, enthroning 
reason as the new god of the age. Kant questioned reason, imprisoning man within the confines of his own mind. Hegel deified history, leaving man with nothing but an ill-defined hope for a utopian future. The French Revolution shows freedom, equality, and brotherhood as their gods of choice, willing to sacrifice everything in their path until these gods were satisfied. While the church held strong for decades, in our next episode, we'll see how these threats from without became threats from within, and how the popes of the 20th and 21st century stood strong against modernism. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us on The Heresies. Founding by Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, the Catholic Church has faced attacks. Numerous hostile governments, tyrannical regimes, and revolutionary movements have sought to destroy the Catholic Church from without. But the greater threat has always been from within. In every generation, the Church has contended with heretics over questions concerning the very essence of the religion. In history, there have been erroneous understandings of the revelation that God has made in Christ. A heresy, it's not simply a falsehood. It's actually a truth, but it's a truth that's been broken off from the whole, so it's a partial truth. In this series, we're going to look at the great heresies. We'll see how the ideological struggles of the past are anything but fossilized subjects, but rather living temptations with which the church must contend again and again. Heresies never really go away. Uh, the ideas that are attractive to people in the first and second century still seem to have a lot of attraction for people today. And Along the way, we'll see how the doctrines of the church developed and gained clarity in the church's struggle with heretics. And we'll have a deeper awareness about what's at stake today. We'll explore all this and more on the heresies. April 2005, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, in his last public homily before ascending the throne of St. Peter, laid out what he saw as the central challenge facing the church today. We are building a dictatorship of relativism, he said, which no longer recognizes anything as definitive. What Ratzinger was critiquing at the beginning of the 21st century as relativism is precisely what Pius X at the beginning of the 20th called modernism. Modernism as a heresy undermines the ability to serenely and fully embrace the faith and by means of that faith to come to know and love God. Modernism can almost be described as the heresy of formlessness or shapelessness. Divine revelation never takes on a concrete shape or a concrete form, but instead is fluid as it kind of ebbs and flows through the religious experience of individuals and of communities within the Catholic Church. 
as we saw in our last episode, Modernism Part 1. With the emergence of the modern world comes radically new ways of envisioning our capacity to know objective reality, the meaning of history, the purpose of institutions, and the nature of the human person itself. Over the course of the 19th century, these philosophic ideas began to influence Catholic theology, marking the beginnings of what becomes known as the heresy of modernism. The modernist crisis in the church was a period of great angst, confusion, and complication. It emerged from Enlightenment ideas, modern ideas, particularly with regard to philosophy and the views of history um, serving as lenses through which the Catholic faith was to be reevaluated. We first see modernist theology in the area of biblical studies, scholars influenced by historicism, the theory that social and cultural phenomena are determined by history, begin to argue that there has been an evolution in humanity's understanding of God, that the authors of scripture were conditioned and limited by the times in which they lived. The historical critical method emerges out of the Renaissance project of returning to the original languages, returning to archeology, span doing the kind of historical work to understand all the particulars of the biblical text, much of which is laudable and Catholics took up what was laudable in it. But it betrays a certain historicism, which is to say that how do you understand the Bible? Not by way of hopes and counsels, not by way of the teaching of the bishop, not by way of the church's liturgy, but you understand the Bible by a different standard of judgment, namely history. The temptation is to lean into relativism rather than to also look to the church as providing the standard for judging the meaning of scripture. Two key representatives of modernist theology were Alfred Lausy and an Irish Jesuit priest named George Tyrrell. Each represents an attempt by theologians to reinterpret the church in terms of modern ideas and modern movements. Father Loisy uh, wrote books which reflected the philosophical and theological torment, and it was basically an embrace of an enlightenment worldview, particularly in trying to understand the truths uh, of the scriptures, there's a denial of the miraculous and a way to try and explain away things in the scriptures. Miracles are just stories created to bolster people in accepting uh, Christ as God. Alfred Loisy began to deny, for example, things that were unquestioned before. For example, that Moses authored the books of the Pentateuch, that all of the details of the Bible were true. And so what we see in Loisy was an attempt to rethink, restudy, reconsider the Bible in the light of the modern historical critical methods. Loisy, as a chief representative of the modernists, argued that the church is not only a living organism, but an evolving organism, continually adapting and responding to its situations, so much so that its fundamental dogmas and doctrines can change over time. Another significant modernist is uh, the Jesuit priest George Tyrrell, a very gifted writer and essayist with a keen interest in biblical exegesis, in modern ideas, and in Catholic doctrine. And George Tyrrell is most famous because he began to apply modern philosophical ideas to the Christian doctrine, soccer doctrine as a whole. And like Loisy, uh, Tyrrell thought that human reason ultimately had greater authority to know a truth than faith that informs reason's search for knowledge of the truth. According to modernism, the sacraments are merely human conventional symbols by which we kind of ineptly try to express God's mysteries. According to modernism, scriptures are not only filled with errors, they're really just the best that human beings can do in trying to articulate the mystery of God. Tyrrell and uh, Loisy, they make of Christianity not a religion of the word, but a religion of our human experience. 
Christianity becomes a religion of how we experience God. Revelation turns into a matter of our encounter, or feeling, or our contact with what we take to be God, and it's no longer the reception in hearing of an intelligible word spoken to us. Despite the church's best efforts, modernist ideas began to spread in schools and in seminaries. Up next, we'll see how the church in the 19th and 20th centuries respond to the threat. Stay tuned. After the horrors of the French Revolution, the church took a very hard line against modernist ideas. In 1865, Pope Pius IX issues his syllabus of heirs. In this document, he condemns 80 heresies that had emerged since the dawn of the modern world. At the First Vatican Council in 1869, the bishops of the world affirmed the doctrine of papal infallibility, claiming that when the pope speaks authoritatively on matters of faith and morals, he cannot err. In the latter years of the 19th century and into the first years of the 20th, Pope Leo XIII worked to restore the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas and his metaphysical realism. But despite these efforts, modernist ideas continued to grow, threatening the very foundations of Catholic theology. When Pope Pius X assumes the chair of St. Peter in 1903, he took up the fight with renewed boldness. In September 1907, Pius X promulgates the encyclical Pacendi Dominici Gregis, feeding the Lord's flock. In the document, he formulates a synthesis of modernism and condemns it as embracing every heresy. He describes the key errors embraced by the heretics as agnosticism, immanentism, evolutionism, and reformism. Pius X identified several uh, characteristic features of modernist thought that were particularly dangerous to Christian thinking and more importantly to human salvation. And the first thing he identifies is a fundamental agnosticism. What does he mean by that? He points to the fact that the modernists are skeptical at best or deny at worst that human reason can come to true and certain knowledge about God. Immanentism is a philosophical belief that God works within in a way that rejects God's transcendence. For an immanist, God is so much within that he is not transcendent. The Catholic belief is that God is higher than anything that is highest of this world and more imminent than anything that is most inward in this world. But for an immanist, God is only that which is operating within. And an immanist thinks that God does not have any transcendence. Evolutionism is an idea that the church's teachings are just human constructs that have attempted to encapsulate this radically subjective, sentimental experience of God. And because they're just human constructs, symbols that attempt to express this more basic and more real experience of God, then of course they're going to change over time and they ought to change over time as our experiences change. Reformism is this idea that we must constantly reform the church, we must constantly reform society, and that reformation doesn't really have any transcendent standard, that we don't have any rational objective standard for reform, uh, nor do we have any transcendent supernatural standard for reform. What you do is you reform for reform's sake. You reform because you see something you don't like and you want change. It really is a kind of uh, love of change for the sake of change, a reformism that's decoupled from a real objective and transcendent standards is really a recipe for a kind of cacophony of claims. Realizing that these ideas were deeply lodged within the church, in 1910, Pius X introduced the anti-modernist oath, which he required of all clergy, preachers, religious superiors, and professors in seminaries. Pius 
The 10th had recognized that Pashendi didn't solve the problem. He identified the problem to the best of his ability at the time, but simply condemning it was not enough. And there were continued and even more forceful expressions of modernism that were occurring. And so a second step that he took was to require this oath of persons in authority in the church and principally you know, priests and bishops to take an oath against modernism. And this was an effort to ensure the authority of the church in these matters. St. Pius X wanted to restore all things in Christ. St. Pius X saw that modernism was the synthesis of all heresies that everything that was wrong that came before was found in this collection that he called modernism. How successful was Pius X in protecting the church? He was successful in the sense that he gave the intellectual resources for protecting the church. Did it mean that the church never had to deal with Catholics embracing these errors again? No, it didn't mean that. If that's the standard, then he failed. But I think the deeper reality is that just the very existence of his writings uh, against the errors of modernism uh, remain a, a constant source of help to Catholics today. You know, it's extraordinary that today, a young person at 17 could go back and read those words and read them while he's studying philosophy, where a different view from the Catholic Church's view of reason is being presented. That is success, that his words remain with us as a constant help. Pope St. Pius X identified what he saw as the key ills inflicting the church of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Despite his bold response, modernism continued to spread. Up next, we'll see how the popes of the 20th and 21st centuries have responded to the challenge. Stay tuned. Despite the firmness of Pius X's response to modernism and the oath that was required of all priests and formators for over 50 years, in the latter half of the 20th century, we see a great resurgence of modernism in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council was a continuation of the First Vatican Council. If you look at the intent of St. John the 23rd when he convoked the council, because the challenges that faced the church in the 19th century were still present in new ways in the 20th. And that included the modernist uh, critique of Catholic teaching. So Catholic teaching was meant to be better presented, explained, and enunciated in continuity with the perennial teaching of the church, but in response to modern challenges. The Second Vatican Council thought it best to engage the questions of the contemporary period, implementing some of the contemporary language and concerns in the conciliar documents, and it wanted to offer a fresh, vital, dynamic, and truth-filled re-articulation of the Articles of Faith. Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, the Word of God, could be read as precisely a response to the questions that were being raised to the modernist heresies that were being propounded early in the 20th century. Dei Verbum identifies three basic principles that are of extreme importance. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, which is the teaching authority of the church. Dei Verbum teaches that all three work harmoniously together because the magisterium, that teaching authority of the church, is at the service of sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Dei Verbum says that if you take out one of these three, the whole thing collapses. By some grace of the Holy Spirit, the texts of the Second Vatican Council brilliantly defend the faith, but the split, as it were, between the modernist and the anti-modernist manifested itself in the reception of the council. So that you had a kind of spirit of Vatican II, which was modernist, and the texts of Vatican II, which certainly were not modernist, which were in communion with all the previous teachings of the popes and councils. And we still live with that tension today. Some of the spirit of the post-Vatican II period unfortunately reflected a modernist attempt to not renew all things in Christ, which was Pius X's motto, 
but rather to overthrow all things from the past and to create a new reality in the church. The spirit of the post-Vatican II era in the minds of many is to overthrow what has been inherited and to replace it with new arrangements. There were a handful of theologians in particular that founded this journal, Concilium, right after Vatican II. And some of those figures were Hans Küng, uh, Skilebex, some of the more progressive members, of the progressive theologians in the church at the time. But then there were others, such as Joseph Ratzinger and Henri de Lubac and Hansus von Balthasar. And they founded another journal called Communio. And Communio was understood in terms of restoring the full tradition of the church. So interpreting Vatican II in continuity with the church's tradition rather than a revolutionary break from it. When you see Ratzinger and you see Hans Kung and their different interpretations, Ratzinger believed at Vatican II, you put all the questions on the table. That's what the church does in council. But after the council, there has to be a kind of sense of everyone has to take a deep breath and we have to sort of get back to a, a kind of more unified stance. Whereas I think Kuhn saw the council primarily as an event, as a ball that had gotten rolling. And there needs to be more reform and more updating and more change. And I think you see those two tendencies really come to a head in the 60s, 70s and 80s in the church. The division within the church between those who read Vatican II as the beginning of an ongoing revolution within the church and those who read Vatican II in continuity with the entirety of the church's tradition is very much alive today. The papacies of John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis have all dealt with this conflict each in his own way. John Paul II and Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, are very clearly in line with this communio interpretation of Vatican II, which is desire to read Vatican II in continuity with the history of the church and to draw on the church's deep resources to reinterpret the world in relation to the church. We see in the papacy of John Paul II, the robust use of St. Thomas, both philosophically and theological, in combating modern errors. He uses the writings and teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas to articulate what makes human persons happy, virtue, holiness, and what makes human persons sad and frustrated, sin and vice. So with John Paul II, he is a more overt response to the problems that remain from modernism in our contemporary period. When we turn to Pope Benedict XVI's response to modernism, we can think about how one thing that characterized his pontificate was this concern about what he called the dictatorship of relativism. Relativism is one of these processes within modernism, and Benedict XVI wanted to have this confidence in the faith in the goodness of Jesus Christ who comes to us to be our savior. Relativism and modernism both flow from the autonomous exaltation of human subjectivity. And so in many ways one could see even though Pius X and Benedict XVI are different popes with different agenda, the fact of the matter remains they both in their different times with their respective efforts are trying to combat the still modern belief, conviction, tendency to think that my human subjectivity governs, divides, orients, instructs, formulates reality. Pope Francis is a more complicated figure. Upon his election, there have been quite a few people that interpreted that as a return to the hopes of this revolutionary interpretation of Vatican II. I think that's an un-Catholic way of interpreting Pope Francis's papacy. Pope Francis, I think, fights modernism in his own way uh, through that phrase of the throwaway culture in which he asks us to not throw away the elderly to not throw away the unborn. When he talks about abortion as being like hiring a hitman, he's, I think, identified the practical outcome of these errors in which we have become so radically attached to a dictatorship of relativism that we not only forget God, but we destroy the person. Many of us have assumed, absorbed many of the, the modern presuppositions about reality, about reason, and about faith. 
And without realizing it, we import these preconceptions, which we don't realize are incompatible with the faith. We import them into our Christian life experience and understanding. Pope Francis is supremely confident that God remains constant, that he is real. And so Pope Francis also, I think, has done us a great service in helping respond to any lingering effects of modernism in the modern period. Over 100 years ago, Pope St. Pius X called modernism the synthesis of all heresies. Where other heresies question one or more dogmas of the church, modernism questions the very possibility of dogmatic truth itself. Despite the efforts of popes, encyclicals, and ecumenical councils, modernism remains very much with us today. It's the mission of the church, as it has always been, to faithfully proclaim the gospel and pass on that faith that comes to us from the apostles to the next generation. Thanks for joining us on The Heresies. <laughs>